Welcome to the Canadian Philosophy Show. Uh, today we're going to talk about moral realism and specifically Hilary Putnam's position on it. However, uh, let us introduce the our guests or co-producers for tonight. So we have, uh, if you will. Um, Michael, you can introduce yourself. <laughs> uh, my name is Michael Robert Kaditz, uh, alumnus of Vancouver Island University. Uh, yes. Tegan, what about you? <laughs> well, hi guys, I'm Tegan Marshall. I am also a current VIU student, uh, and I am excited to dive into this topic to see if there is any reality to our morality. And Nicole. Yeah, uh, my name is Nicole Kerrigan. I'm a student at Simon Fraser University, and I'm very interested in the topic of moral realism. So thank you for having me here. Yeah, uh, before I go any further, I'm Mark Charles. I'm a yeah, philosophy student from SFU, and I'm, well, the host, or well, I guess a very new host for tonight. Um, so yeah, uh, what are we talking about here exactly? Well. That is uh, well, Hilary Putnam's position on moral realism. So moral realism is, well, I guess uh, that statements about morality or morality in general do in fact have a truth value that is objective. So uh, Hilary Putnam, he's sort of responding to a very prevalent tradition in philosophy that has stemmed from empiricists uh, in that you know, they sort of regard s statements of sentiment or of normative value to be subjective or not really have a truth value. So there's, of course, you know, statements like, well, uh, this curry is tasty, right? Or so on and or killing is wrong or killing is bad. And to empiricists, sort of those statements aren't they don't have any truth value to them. Uh, and this is sort of where it stems from, I'd say, and Pierce's being that they believe knowledge, it's an epistemic position where they believe knowledge is derived from experience and not anything that you can, not anything that comes from your reason, right? So th this is, of course, it, opposed to rationalists who believe the opposite, that knowledge comes from your reasoning. Now, uh, it sort of has developed uh, throughout, I guess, the last century, right? That um, through the logical positivists, and it, it was a very prevalent tradition and it sort of died down. However, its conclusions are still very prevalent, namely that, you know, morality is subjective or doesn't have a truth value and so on. And this is sort of who Putnam is, uh, Hilary Putnam is responding to. He's responding to these analytic philosophers primarily who despite at least according to him a lot of the premises and arguments for a fact value distinction right so that facts and values are distinguishable namely that facts have truth values have a truth value and values do not have a truth value to them now um yeah putnam believes that in fact, that you can, that truth out, I guess, values do in fact have a truth to them. And that, in fact, when you're arguing for, well, when you're arguing for that uh, value statements do not have a truth value or moral statements don't have a truth value, in fact, you're also, it's sort of a bit inconsistent to argue this because, uh, many analytic philosophers or are realists in that be they believe that there is scientific values and epistemic values and that he believes that if you sort of criticize well um criticize moral values well in fact all these critiques towards moral values they're in fact very similar to critiques you can just raise against epistemic values and he's saying that you know it's just inconsistent to do this. 
So, it, I, so if people want to go around and give their initial opinions on this, I think we could start up a discussion like this. Thanks, Mark. Who wants to start? I I I struggle with. Uh, I I I agree with uh, Putnam here that uh, in his. I got to be honest and say that I did not come prepared for this topic. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Mark, I beg your indulgence if uh, if I get some things factually wrong here, but nice. like. I kind of appreciate this position because it, it presents it presents to something that that I've always held to as an individual that you know that morality isn't strictly some sub, uh, subjective thing which is dependent on the individual but there is um, some baseline kind of code of conduct for how we should act and behave at least. Um, the, at least within society, uh, our our own societies. Um, I think it's also interesting. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. That he does critique those that try and separate um, the values from f facts, because um, at least in my opinion, the facts should inform your values. Um, it, it shouldn't be the other way around. So I don't think, and I think Putnam and I would agree that those two things need to be separated for there to be validity and understanding. What do you think, Mark? Did I get it right or am I off base here? <laughs> well, um, at least my, I think we might have a different understanding of a fact value distinction. So as I understand it, the fact value distinction has normally been to that, to say that there are certain statements which are facts, right? And they have a truth value to them, right? And then values are not like that. Values are sentiments. They don't have a truth value. You know, you can say this curry is tasty, right? But that wouldn't have a truth value to it. That would just be, I guess, from a point of a yeah, perhaps some meta-ethical views would say that's the same as you as you're saying curry, yay, right? Or murder is killing, murder, boo, right? There's no real truth value or facts expressed in that. And right. what Putnam is trying to say is that there isn't really any metaphysical clear distinction between facts and value statements. You know, when I say killing is wrong, it's the same as... I'm saying that uh, this brick or this microphone is gray. They're the same types of statements. And he says that there might be a practical difference, but there's not necessarily a clear metaphysical distinction. Right. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And I mean, I think this gets into even possibly a discussion on the impact of language and how we understand concepts. Um, right, because if there is no clear distinction, we generally look to language for that distinction. And if there really isn't one, then that poses an interesting question of should we create one or are we missing something within the actual language we use to convey an idea? Yeah, I think that's interesting. I, I think my initial response is that we use language to model sort of reality right we can't i can't say stone right and then i guess specific instead of specifically conveying the meaning and understanding of stone there's going to be like some specific barrier perhaps right um and i guess we model language to reality rather than reality to language and maybe sort of putnam's trying to argue against about that in some way yeah i i do have some uh, something to say here too so i was i'm not very familiar with putnam and i'm very um happy that i learned about putnam um based on mark's recommendation here 
Um, I actually remember putting them saying something about language and how language is actually a fueling reason for why people don't believe in moral realism, specifically empiricists um, and people who really subscribe to the scientific method. Um, I'm looking for the quote um, right now, but I, let's see, he did say something specifically about that. So just searching, unless somebody remembers what it is, but he did, um, but Putnam did specifically say that the conclusion that there, that objective values are a relic of the past since we're in a scientific age is false because it assumes that if ethics is objective, then it is a description and therefore that comes from a problem of our language. That was part of his uh, Putnam's argument. I'm not sure if I understand it 100%. Perhaps Mark or yeah. somebody else understood that part better, but Maybe. I think it is relevant. So I... The way I understood this, I um, read up a bit on him in some other place. So I don't think we're necessarily talking about the same passage, but perhaps we're talking about the same opinion. So he talks a lot about how that, especially with the synthetic analytic distinction, right? Uh, it says that, you know, if there is a truth out, if something has to be true, it has to be descriptive, right? Or empiric empirically, you know, verifiable. It's according to Carnap, right? Um, and he sort of says that these sort of, I guess, modern empiricist or logical positivists, right? They are sort of trying to, they define a category of meaning or cognitive meaning, right? And then they fit everything into that category. And he sort of criticizes that saying that, you know, well, of course, when you define what meaning is, right? And then if you look on something, uh, that's not descriptive, right? And you define meaning as being descriptive, then of course it's not going to be meaningful or cognitively meaningful, right? And he says, well, that's just not how it works in everyday language, right? We, you know, from our experience, right, you know, we talk a lot about non empirically verifiable things, right? And why would we if they weren't meaningful, right? And so it's very much trying to, it's instead of like, looking at meaning as something natural it's like defining it in one category and then trying to put everything within that category thanks yeah if you'd like to hear my view i'll <laughs> be happy to give it i'd be very happy to hear it <laughs> So I believe that Putnam stakes out a position in between two extremes. So on one extreme you have what's, what's referred to as metaphysical realism, which is the hardcore belief that uh, if, there, if there is uh, morality, it's just as much an objective feature of the world as matter itself, as a rock or a tree or the earth itself. And uh, of course, you can take the other side of that coin, which is that if morality is not an objective feature of the world, then it doesn't exist. And it's um, imaginary. So, and, and that's related to the logical positivist view, which of course is that if something isn't verifiable, scientifically verifiable, physically verifiable, then it's irrational to claim its existence. That the meaning, the meaning of something is in its physical verifiability. So the logical positivist view is similar to the metaphysical realist view. But Putnam denies both of these. On the other extreme, you have the moral relativist view, which is that morality is simply not objective at all. It's relative to culture or to groups of people. They create their own morality. And Putnam rejects that extreme also. He argues that moral relativism is, well, it's, it's incorrect for a lot of reasons, but one of them is that it's simply self-refuting 
<laughs> because uh, if, if I were to say it's, an, it's a fact that morality is relative that's a self-refuting statement because well how can it how can it be a fact how, how can we say that morality is relative is that a, is that that is my that's my that must be my relative view <laughs> what if if you say morality is not relative and i say it's relative <laughs> then which one of us is right and if i were to be consistent that it's relative then i would have to say oh well maybe maybe it's objective so that's one of the reasons he 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 refutes that extreme of moral relativism but he's what he does is he stakes out a position in the somewhere in between which is that morality is not an objective fact of the world independent of the human being morality does not exist out there in in, in the forest it is something that exists in people's minds so in that sense it's subjective this is similar to a conversation we had last week or the week before about what is the definition of objectivity versus subjectivity so i think what putnam's saying is is that morality is 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 not objective in the sense that it exists in the world in the forest or in the rocks independent of human beings but it is objective in the sense that we can that human beings can arrive at an objective definition of morality through their rationality so human beings have rationality and moral principles can be derived ra rationally. Now, I believe that that's very similar in many ways to what Kant argues. Kant argues a similar thing, which is that you can determine what's moral by applying his um, categorical imperative, a rational process, um, which, you know, one of the ways of looking at the categorical imperative is that it, that that a, a to claim something is a moral directive you have to show that it's universalizable that it makes rational sense to be to apply to everybody all the time so Kant argues that so, so an example of that would be like um, it would not be rational it would not be universalizable to say stealing is good or killing is good because if those in fact were moral imperatives then pretty soon you couldn't have a society You'd have everyone stealing everyone's stuff or people dying and killing each other. That's irrational. So it is it is rational and it is universalizable to say you should not steal and you should not kill. That leads to a civilized society that one can live in that's sustainable. So that's the rational process that Kant argues for. And I think Putnam is doing a similar thing. He's saying that that morality exists in people's minds, true. But rational people will arrive at a universalizable set of moral standards. Mark, what do you think about that perspective? Well, yeah, I think it's very interesting. Um, I don't really think it necessarily addresses like empiricist concerns, right? So like David Hume, he would say that, you know, it's no less rational to like... Uh, you know, like, uh, I guess, society being functional than to, for society to be dysfunctional. Um, I think it would maybe have, I, I'm not entirely sure I understood the first argument either in terms of, I don't really necessarily think it's entirely like too strong of an argument because, you know, one can of course say that morality has no truth value right and of course you know everything does have an appearance value to it so like for me uh, a book can appear to be great and for another person it can appear to be not as great so i i don't think it's necessarily self-refuting um but, yeah, um but I, I'm, I'm very interested in when he talks about epistemic value with moral values and how they're entangled. Because, of course, there are categorical imperatives and hypothetical imperatives, which are different from each other, you know. So if I say, like, for example, if I, um, if I want to bake a cake, I should get eggs for that cake, right? Or... That statement is very different from me saying you shouldn't kill, right? 
I'm not saying if you don't want to harm people, you shouldn't kill. I'm just saying you shouldn't kill. And of course, I'm very, uh, I'm very curious on how this works with epistemic values. So mm -hmm. on if values are of the same sort. So I think for me, it sounds like Putnam is saying that epistemic values are have exactly the same nature as moral values. It sounds. I have a thought. Yeah, yeah, if I, I if you don't mind me. Yeah, so I'm actually going to apply Kant's um, categorical imperative and hypothetical imperative, kind of the, the, the essence of that too, to this idea. So the way I, I, I see um, morality is that I see that society or our culture, or whatever, has constructed morality as a categorical imperative saying that you ought not to kill and reasoning it in a categorical imperative sense is you ought not to do something. But I think that in essence, we act as a hypothetical imperative. I, if I do not want to go to jail, I will not kill. And that, I think that is like the most evidence that we have. And I guess maybe this is from an empiricist kind of point of view, but I think that's the, the best that we can really do because there's not, I, I'm not convinced that there is uh, an objective morality that I should accept, right? I, 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 of course, I think I'm more pr privy to the idea of almost an existentialist autonomy view of morality, that I, I choose which morals will help me be the most authentic person I can be, which is very subjective in that sense. Like, I think that's closer than some i would ex be fat quicker to accept that rather than somebody saying that oh you should not kill because killing is bad or or something i i, I don't know maybe there's something wrong with the way i think for me to come to that conclusion but and i, I love hearing other perspectives but what, what but about yeah, i guess that's where how i'd relate to a categorical imperative and hypothetical imperative to that like i think that a lot of us act in a way that in, in that we are um, putting towards a categorical imperative to values when our society is telling it, or hypothetical, sorry, when our society is telling us it's more of a categorical imperative. And I do think that we do, we are ingrained to believe that killing is actually bad and we do get a visceral reaction to that based on largely how we were raised. That's, that's my perspective. I um, There's another point of view, which is from evolutionary psychology which is that moral standards may have evolved because of evolutionary advantage it's pretty hard not to acknowledge that even though empirically obviously people kill each other there seems to be a seems to be a universalizability around prohibition against killing and i know it's ironic because there is so much killing in the world, but even you know, even in societies where there's a lot of killing, there still are moral prohibitions against just like indiscriminately walking up to people and killing them. Um, it may be done for bad reasons, you know, like genocide or political reasons or that kind of thing. But um, but it seems pretty common throughout human history that there's at least at least a um, an attempt, or at least a stated goal, to avoid killing, um, and and um, and and maybe that's just hardwired in 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 human genes, be because it provides an evolutionary advantage. I mean, if if everyone killed each other all the time, then the the race species probably wouldn't survive. So, um, I mean, there aren't there other things that that you would have to admit are instinctual, that are innate. I mean mating like our sexual drives our, our drive to eat our drive at self-preservation all of these things have evolved presumably because it gives us an evolutionary advantage and the ability to, to survive as a species so why isn't it reasonable to say that certain moral um principles such as you know not killing and not and not and not stealing and not causing harm for you know um for for no good reason that those are instinctual also and here and and lastly i'll just finish with this example which is a 
a quick thought experiment in, in, in favor of moral realism. Imagine yourself walking on a path by a stream where there's walkers and you notice a, a, a little baby or a little girl like trips and falls into the stream. Would, wouldn't, wouldn't most people, wouldn't you guys, like if you reach down and try and save that little child? It isn't doesn't that seem to be an instinctual thing that we have? So I think this is an argument for for moral moral realism, not in in the um, sense that morality exists out there in the rocks, but that morality exists inside of humans. We've evolved this way for for various reasons, including evolutionary advantage, and 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 these are objective standards. They're not they're not simply. Oh, I decided that killing is okay, or in your in your province, killing is not okay, but in our province, killing is okay. And and so I think Putnam is claiming something similar to to, to what I, to to what I'm outlining as a as as a middle ground. Yeah, I, I think you bring up some very interesting points on that, like how much we should consider our instincts in regards to morality, and there is always a big question because many like anti-realists would of course say that you know our instincts develop specifically for evolutionary needs and it's not necessarily the case that our evolutionary needs co correspond with i guess what is moral right if it was the case that killing people was moral right you know we wouldn't have evolved like that anyway because it's be disadvantaged for society to do that you can't have a society where people just kill each other um so i i think that's a really interesting question about how much it is how much it can sort of yeah rely upon that intuition but then of course we use our intuition for many different things for our epistemic values too you know we value reproducibility despite it not perhaps having a logical basis to it so no rational basis i read a really good paper uh on this topic and uh i want to read i just want to read a couple lines from it which i think articulates part of putnam's argument against moral relativism which is the position on one extreme so Putnam points out that, uh, and he mentions Wittgenstein's private language argument. I got to think about that. Anyway, he says, Putnam says that relativists cannot make the distinction between actually being right and simply thinking one is right. Therefore, Putnam argues relativists see thinking as nothing beyond producing images and sentence analogs in the mind in the hope of having a subjective feeling of being right. So I think that's a important point because those who argue and um, you know that 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 morality is simply relative to your culture or social group or cult country or the time you're living in they're not distinguishing between believing one is right that is to say our culture believes that morality is x and another culture believes just as strongly that morality is y a moral relativist who says well that's what morality is it's just relative to culture is not acknowledging that there's a distinction between thinking you're right and actually um being right so this is great philosophy because it's a so i have a i have a yeah. Yeah, so this is also another tradition in philosophy. So the claimant has the burden of proof. So if somebody's saying that morality exists, you have the burden of proof to prove that it, ex it exists. And so proof is provided with with amounts, strong amounts, convincing amounts of confirming evidence, right? So um, if it's empirical, you can argue truth from an empirical 
or a rational point of view. So I gave you what I what I believe to be a very powerful empirical argument for the existence of morality, mm -hmm. which is that most people would, without even thinking about it, reflexively, instinctively try and save a little girl that fell into a stream. I, that I claim that to be the case. That you know, I mean, it, we could do mm -hmm. a survey or a study or something like that. But I, I mean, suggest that any of us here, and probably it, almost anybody, but that that proves. Yeah. But that proves social constructivism. That's further evidence to show towards social constructivism because, um, and I, I'm, I wouldn't call myself a proponent of social constructivism. I, I am very compassionate to that view for m many parts of the moral relativism argument. But with, with a, a large component of, of um, social constructivism also argues that you will not, like, I guess, actively know that you are choosing to do a certain thing because these values are ingrained in you by your environment when you are growing up. So if we were, and there's there's many studies on this and um, more, more development of, of morality and psych psychology and developmental psychology. Um, but if you are, if a child is taken away from a regular environment and raised in, I don't know what you would say, but it, they used to, back in the day, they would say savage environment. They would reflect those things that they were taught. So you saying that you are, would save a, a, a girl in a well now is not a proper or a, a, even objective reflection of what you, what the realm of possibilities is because you were only raised in this environment that you were raised in. You don't know what you would do if you're raised in a different environment. And that's a really strong argument against that notion that you talked about in that paper. And this is this is shown all throughout psycho psychological studies. Yeah, but um, there's some kind of fallacy in, in your argument, and I'm <laughs> we'll have to do a, a show on hit me with it. Fallacies, <laughs> but oh, I'm, I'm happy. happy. <laughs> there's something that doesn't follow. So even if there's some truth in your argument, so even if there's some truth, even if we give you that um, that in different cultures, either real or hypothetical. Uh, that humans could behave in totally different ways, even given a um, stimulus such as someone falling in a stream. It doesn't follow from that that the impulse that I, I argue mo that any of us here and most people would have to save a ch drowning child, that that is simply learned. I, I, you know, I, so in other words, I can accept that that culture influences human behavior but but it doesn't follow that if culture influences human behavior and therefore human behavior and values vary from one culture to another either real or hypothetical it doesn't follow that everything that we do is simply manufactured and, and internalized by our, and constructed and internalized from our culture I'm I, th I think that both can be true that culture influences us and certain things we're hardwired for. I don't think our sex drives yeah. are culturally produced. I don't think that our, you know, our, 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 our will to live is cult will, culturally produced. Yeah. I will say like uh, impulse control. Like, can I quickly just say something then take and I'll let you. Focus. Well, I think you, you and I are going to say the exact same thing. So go ahead. Yeah, but I, I uh, maybe not, but I would just say about the impulse control thing. I would argue based on, I'll give an example, but this is also shown in psychological research. Impulse control it, or impulses are learned. Right. Um, so let's say that I and I actually this is a true story. I, I worked as a lifeguard for for quite a while and learning a CPR is is it becomes an impulse because you practice it over and over and over again and then it becomes second nature. So you don't have to actively think about what you're doing and all the rescues that you would do, mm -hmm. um, the procedures, you know, grabbing the, no. the, the float and going and driving in, bringing this person out. That's, you're not thinking about yet. You're not thinking about it step by step. It's an impulse. And that's something that you would just, you would jump into the water and you would do your procedure. 
and you wouldn't think about it because that's an impulse. And uh, I would yeah. argue that other, maybe, no, maybe there's some sort of impulse that isn't learned that way. Perhaps I would even argue that sex drive is a, would fall under that as well. But I, impulses can definitely be learned. These autom- these almost automated responses and learns that there these are habits. The habits are definitely learned and reinforced, and they're reinforced by the context that we live in, the society that we live in. That's my, yeah, but, but that's, at least that's where my perspective. Yeah, but don't conflate the impulse with the strategy. So if, if I have an impulse to save somebody who's drowning, that's distinct from the strategy that I might have learned to do so. So when you go to a first aid course or a CPR mm-hmm. course, you're learning a strategy to address the impulse to save somebody. So the strategy, I totally agree, is is learned behavior. I, I'm not born knowing how to, you know, how to how to uh, perform CPR on somebody. But I'm arguing that I am born yeah. with an impulse, which is innate, not culturally learned, to try and save somebody. I, I believe, I strongly believe, and I argue that I think most people would agree with me that human just, beings, yeah. well, that human beings have, a, have an innate tendency to care for one another, to love one another, and to protect one another. Now, of course, empirically, that doesn't always happen. But to argue that that we're just like born completely tabula rasa and we only learned to care for each other, I don't buy that. I mean, there's a possible objection, I'll, and I'll like say it really quickly, and then I'll let Tegan say say his point. The bystander effect is a quite a good objection to that view because there there have been many instances. It's documented. It's it's written in textbooks. There, when you are faced in a situation that is where you want to do something, and there's people around you, you end up not doing something, right? Um, let's say that there's somebody that needs to be saved, somebody drowning. And you're with uh, uh, other people around you, and you don't do that. How do? What does that say about your impulse to save somebody? If your impulse to save somebody is really that strong and it's really innate, wouldn't that override the bystander effect? No. And I, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't really necessarily agree with that as that um, statement, but I think it is a consideration, and there's definitely. Yeah, but that, there's definitely some conversation to be had on this topic. For yeah, sure. but that that impulses can't be overridden or can't be changed by culture or by the immediate situation. It doesn't it doesn't follow from that? If, you know, if they can be, if impulses can be overridden, it doesn't follow that there is no impulse. That's innate. So, mm-hmm. uh, and that, in fact, that's my position. My position is that that there are innate, um, there are built-in innate objective. Uh, um, you know, features of, 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 of human personality and human behavior that are very likely and often influenced by, 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 by culture and, and, and can be changed or stifled or, mm-hmm. or, or squashed or, exa- or exaggerated. But, um, yeah. I, and I'm, I, I'm, I think Putnam, I'm, I think I'm close to what Putnam might argue. Anyway, uh, yeah. uh, Tegan, what do you think? Tegan, go ahead. Yeah. Um, um, I mean, I think, I think you use the example of, you know, Mikey, you said we have an, an, an innate behavior, I would say an innate desire to, you know, love, protect, and whatever the third thing was that you said, you can tell that my brain's half, like, dead at this point um but like as much as i think that's true the innate the innate behavior only gets us so far um so to and i mean this is this is an interesting interesting question that comes up it it is the role of feelings and behavior and perception. So, um, I, I see where you're going, Mikey, and I see where Nicole is coming from. But, like, this is a tough one. I, like, I had a point. I thought it was a good point, but then I lost it. So, um, I, I don't know quite what to make of this one. 
because yeah we do have biological biological things which are innate such as you know sex drive appetite stuff like that but i would say that those are only understood um by by being in society um because that is um what what oppresses some ideas that people may have and encourages others so i i don't quite i don't know quite what to make of this one personally if i may ask for a clarification do you mean that like desires such as appetites and so on can cannot be understood outside of a cultural context or is it like a structuralist approach sort of or what? Well, oh, are you asking me, Mark? Um, oh, yeah. Just so um, you can clarify a bit. Okay. Uh, I am saying, sorry, I'm like, I'm struggling here. Can you repeat your question? Right. So I heard, uh, I, I sort of understood what you were saying as that you're saying certain desires, um, like appetites or sex drives uh, cannot be right. or only understood like through cultural context or so on like that. And it's making well, me wonder if you think they cannot be understood outside of them or if that's what is what you were saying. Well, yeah, what, what I'm saying is those things exist. They exist, but we cannot fully act on them and, and understand and cooperate them without a without a mentor which in most cases say um say with um you know the sex drive is learned from elders in our communities right who we primarily our parents who we have those conversations with so it's not that we don't like i guess it just provides a fuller understanding to the phenomenon which then informs I, our decisions. I think, yeah. I think I agree in a way, but also disagree in that I don't think that the nature as opposed to like nurture debate or distinction is as great as it is. I, I sort of feel like um, evolutionarily, right? We're supposed, we're meant to be raised by a mother, right? And in fact, that's like the only pre precondition that we can, you know live is if we're raised by someone who cares about us a baby can't go feed itself it can't learn to do anything in this world just by itself so it's like talking about humans outside of a social context is very limiting i believe and that specifically just talking about nurture so I, I think that sort of relates to what you're saying as well in that you're talking about that, you know, there's these drives and desires, which, you know, well, I guess natural, right? But however, calling it natural is, of course, to completely overlook any, you know, biological you know, necess okay. necessitation of cultural influences, right? Yeah, Mark, I really, I really actually like your point here. Um, and I think I have, I'll like further my view as well and just clarify it a little bit. And it's kind of following the theme of psychological research and psychological terminology, nature versus nurture debate. I'm going to talk about temperament. And temperament is a concept that came out of the nature versus nurture debate in psychological research, specifically in developmental psychology. And it's theorized that they're biological factors that that predict the way or predict or cause people to act in a way um, uh, biologically. So, and I, I believe that they confirmed or showed strong evidence towards this theory with twin studies. So if twins were raised in um, different environments, I, I can't give an exact thing, but like if twins are raised in different environments, they would act differently. If they're raised in the same environment and separated, they would act differently. Um, but at the end, they, they showed that people have different, they're inborn 
with different temperaments. Um, and that is, that is outside of any sort of environmental factors, or at least the ones that cannot, there's maybe some that can't be controlled. Like, yeah, you can't, you can't have a um, study and neglect the baby and not feed them. So that could, that obviously might have some sort of effect there, even environmentally, even if they're trying to control for all of the environmental confounds that could come up in the study. So there, there definitely is strong evidence to show that temperament exists and there is, and a temperament is a biological um, theory saying that there's a biological reason for why people act a different way. And the way I come in here with, with the moral realism debate is there, I would say based on temperament using that theory, there are some people that have a tendency inborn tendency to believe that killing is wrong. And there's some people who have an inborn tendency to do, they believe things about killing at different degrees of their morality. So some people might think, oh, killing is okay in some context. Some people might think, you know, all the whatever position somebody could have. But I would say that temperament helps dictate biologically the way people feel about moral issues. Um, and for that reason, objective morality. I, I like, and in terms of moral realism, that morality exists without human interpretation. You know, morality exists out in the world without human beings being on this earth. I think that that is a bit of an objection to that because if there is, I, I maybe not objection to that. Maybe it's an objection to more moral subjectivity. But what I would say really is that there can't be it's hard to say that there's one objective morality like based on a biological argument if ever if everybody's going to be born with a different temperament that that helps um their attunement towards certain moral issues and other people might have less attunement towards other moral issues so i think it's a little bit of an inconsistency there i'm not sure if i'm articulating it uh completely clearly and maybe you guys can help me clarify that but that's where i'm coming from i think temperament can give a uh, perspective on this argument. Hmm. Yeah, no, I, I do agree. Um, did you think the like inconsistency was with your own uh, view or with the view you were opposing? I, I, I just don't think I can use that argument to oppose moral realism per se, because moral realism is defined as something that Say it says moral morality exists irrespective of human activity. So, uh, temperament is a concept of human activity, so it doesn't really align. I would need to, in order to really disprove moral realism, I would need to talk about the cosmos and the universe and make an argument about that. So, yeah. I, but I, but I think like about the colloquial understanding of objective morality, it disproves that, but doesn't might not disprove moral realism because I think moral realism needs a cosmological type argument to disprove yeah. that. Yeah, so as it sounds like I understand you, you're of course saying right that we can argue that, you know, from I guess a sociological perspective, right, that our morality is of course cultural, right, or relative to our culture, right, but talking outside of merely what people understand in culture, that's something completely different and i think this sort of maybe relates back to i think what's called the naturalistic fallacy that you say because something is natural it is therefore good right like you see a lot of i guess perhaps tigers right out, out in the uh, or carnivores i guess out in nature of course killing each other and so on or, or maybe just doing really bad things right and saying that because it's natural for them, therefore it's good is sort of, I, I guess it, it doesn't really follow because it's natural, it's therefore mm -hmm. good. So yeah. it, this sort of also relates to, I guess, a nurture versus cultural debate, right? Where it's like, well, because it is natural, does it therefore mean it's good? It does, it, you seem to need another argument, right? To, of course, for it to actually follow. 
Mm-hmm. For or for it to like uh, for it to address specifically moral realism, I more so with that argument addressing the colloquial understanding of um, objective morality, which is to say that maybe it's not as precise as moral realism, right? Because moral realism is kind of a branch of of objective morality, saying that the objective morality exists irrespective of human activity. But some people th- think or conceptualize objective morality as meaning objective morality exists within whatever our understanding is, but maybe not without human activity ever being on earth. You know, like some people think of objective morality that way. Yeah, but you just described, uh, in my understanding, you described Putnam's position in general, which is that um, morality is not uh, um, something that can be found in, you know, nature outside of humans. However, it's still objective in that um, humans... Um, have ra- rational reasons for universally agreeing on. Is that what Putnam believed? Putnam I believe so. I believe. Is, so. Can we confirm? Um, uh, it it, so- it sounds like that to me at least. Yeah. Yeah, I mean. But wasn't um, Putnam advocating a pr- pretty strong moral realism stance? No, he 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 argues for moral objectivity, but not for moral realism in the sense that a. Mm-hmm. That a that a that a, lo- a logical positive or what he what he calls a metaphysical re- realist would would art would call for. Um, I mean, you know, we'll just have, you know, people have to research this because we we've, we've done our research and um, uh, you know, and, 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 and everyone has different interpretations, right? But my understanding of, of Putnam is that, um, like I said before, he 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 for, forges a middle ground. He 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 denies that that the logical positivist requirement. For uh, the verify for verifiability, he denies that that applies to morality. He he says you cannot dismiss morality as an objective thing merely because it's non-verifiable. He he acknowledges you you can't verify morality, right? You can't do a scientific experiment. You know I, I can do a scientific experiment and you know and determine the chemical composition of you know of of, of water, but I can't do a scientific experiment and and verify morality he, he acknowledges mm-hmm. that but Putnam's whole argument is that that does not it does not follow that because morality is not verifiable it does not follow that because it's not a physical thing in the in the in the, in the world outside of humans it doesn't follow that it's merely relative there's it's still objective so yeah because yeah if, if morality is something that is I, I and again I don't know about the research if, on animals and morality um, but let's assume that it wasn't proven that or shown strong evidence towards saying that animals have morality. Then it wouldn't make sense that there would be an argument for moral realism because then morality would be a construct within humans' heads exclusively. But then that's an interesting conversation. Do animals have morality? Right? Because if they do, and if it, if they can... If it can be shown that they have some, like even they don't, killing is some sort of issue for them, that could be a, a, some sort of evidence towards, or at least one point toward in the direction of moral realism. But I'm not sure, I don't know too much about that. Well, I, I think there's definitely uh, a lot of animals who show, I guess, moral characteristics, right? Empathy in particular, like. Definitely, I've seen a dog be very, like, feel bad about itself if it, like, broke a vase or went digging through the trash. I've seen, you know, mm-hmm. dogs, you know, act really shameful afterwards. Is it, are they afraid of punishment or letting down their owner? Because then that could be almost a, you could almost see that as a social constructivism argument. Like, oh, animals have their own society. They have their own things that they have to call, you know, call to, yeah, right? That's, of course, the case. But I... I, with these sort yeah. of things, I like to take like a more of a behaviorist approach and to say like, well, what's the difference in the end, right? You know, it's sort of like this psychological yeah. egoist approach, you know, do you do everything just for <laughs> yourself? You know, well, it's like you can never really disprove such an example, right? So, yeah, it's sort of like, yeah, just take yeah, my goal is just to be at peace at myself about I just want to be at peace with myself about this distinction because as a philosophy student now um and i don't know how many people relate to me but i have problems 
or some, not, maybe no problems, but I have some hangups about studying ethics because I get I get a little bit salty about this argument. And I'm again, I'm not like strong on either side really. I, I'm more I lean more towards a social constructivist view, but I still like it still bothers me when I'm studying philosophy because I feel like an understanding of it's like if it comes from meta ethics, but I I feel like having like a meta ethical understanding of ethics and having a good base of that and being at peace at that is important before you move on to the next step of applying the ethics and even or even talk about normative ethics because it stems from uh, our presumptions about what is true and what is false about ethics. So I, as a student, I struggle with that still. Yeah, I definitely do too. Um, I think like if you go to any metaphysics class and discuss morality, you know, you're, you're not going to be discussing morality in a very light way. You know, you're going to talk, be talking about it being relative or about a bunch of objections to morality being objective. And what does it even mean for a normative statement to be real, right? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, uh, <laughs> mer, ob, uh, objective versus relative morality is like a hot topic that it, it, it never cools down. It never cools down, and 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 I think a lot of people um, start out like a lot of students go into college being advocates of moral relativism, and then they might change their mind later. When, when they when they see the implications of that the implications of that are I mean look I'm, I'm one of those people I went into one of my classes that I went into my eth my first ethics class at BIU being the you know proud bearer of the news to the professor that morality is actually relative and my proof was empirical mm -hmm. it was like look at the world if killing was morally wrong why does ever why has it happened so much but I, I ended that class feeling quite different about it because if morality is relative, then who are you to impose your moral beliefs on someone someone else? Who are you to? Why was Adolf Hitler wrong? Why do why do uh, you know other uh, despots in the world who who I, I mean, genocide? I why are they wrong? Who are you to say they're wrong? And that's another way of you know it's a way of reframing Put, Putnam's point. There's a distinction between thinking you're right and actually being right. Yeah. Take it. I, I feel like those are two extreme examples, though, that don't really get to the, to the complexity, right? Because Adolf Hitler is an example where the vast majority are going to say, regardless, he was wrong. That, that should not have occurred, right? We're getting into the nitty-gritty details here, and I mean, I get what you're saying, because been there, done that. But at the same time, I, I would, I would, I would end with this: if there isn't a desire for objective morality, why do we impose it by legal statutes? Because, and some would argue that's just so society functions. But does that not point to a deeper level, though? That's that's my yeah. question. That's when Friedrich Nietzsche said God is dead. I think we should do a show on uh, social contract theory, um, because mm -hmm. that's we don't I don't have time now, but that's another oh angle into this. Oh. It's the, the Hobbesian view that people, um, by nature, have no morality. Um, so, but it becomes objective in that they construct. A, yeah. a political state in order to protect themselves from an undesirable state of war of all against all. So that that's a form of objective morality too, but it's a whole nother topic. So great topic, um, uh, Mark. Thank you. Yeah. I really enjoyed hearing your opinions on it. And, all. and yeah, I look forward to the social contract perhaps. Yeah. So thanks. Uh, thanks for everyone for tuning in. Uh, we actually have a YouTube channel as well, so a quick shout out to that, the Canadian Philosophy Show on YouTube. Uh, you can even ask questions to their live, so 
perhaps you can try and do that next time. Anyway, I, I'm Mark Giles uh, from SFU. Uh, I'll let the others introduce themselves before we go. Or detroduce themselves. <laughs> Mike, Michael Robert Cadence. Uh, Nicole Kerrigan. again. I'm Tegan Marshall. Okay. Do you introduce? I like that. 